Right, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so just a quick introduction. As I've already mentioned earlier, I've just finished, well, when I got invited to give this talk, I'd just finished my PhD at University College London, Mullard Space Science Laboratory, and I've put my new institution on here, which is the University of California, Berkeley, which I'll be moving, I'll be moving over there in January to do the same same sort of research so it all applies but I've got a lot of stuff a few things in here which I'm talking as if I'm still at UCL but just so you understand my situation right now so um, yeah my, my new institution is the Space Sciences Laboratory at uh, University of California Berkeley um, so um, yeah thanks very much for having me um, I'm going to talk to you about a subject called space weather today which encompasses all sorts of things that you may or may not have heard of um, and space weather is kind of one of those things where I've found um, that a lot of people kind of maybe know a little bit about but don't actually realize the significance of it and, and how why as a society we need to actually worry about this kind of physics. Um, so I'm going to start off kind of I'm going to start off right at the bottom because I, I like to bring everyone up and to the same level of understanding so I'm going to start to talk about the field of space plasma physics which is what uh, space weather is, is all about um, and there's two main things we've got to understand in space plasma physics and that's plasma physics which is the uh, well I'll explain but there's plasma physics and then there's mag magneto uh, sorry um, words completely gone from uh, my mind Le electromagnetism so space plasma physics so plasma physics and electromagnetism the reason we need to think about those two is because um, there's lots of plasma in space and there's also lots of magnetic fields in space and they interact in very complex ways and that's what kind of drives what we're going to talk about today so um I'll, yeah like i said i'll start start very basic so this is um a drawing of an arrangement of atoms so each of these blue uh circles represents an atom and they're all very tightly bonded uh, and there's very low levels of energy in these atoms and this is generally what we refer to as a solid uh, so the atoms being the matter and the arrangement being the solid state of matter. Um, if you give these atoms energy, um, they the bonds holding them all together tend to loosen off a little bit um, and the state of matter changes and that solid will melt and become a liquid. Uh, and those atoms, as you can see, can move around each other um, and aren't so, so rigidly structured. If you keep adding energy to a liquid, uh, eventually it starts to boil and it becomes a gas and those those bonds completely break and you have um, lots of energetic atoms able to bounce around, um, bounce off of surfaces and off of each other. So three basic states of matter that I'm sure we're all aware of. Um, if we look more closely at an atom, uh, as many of us may know, oops, uh, there's a, an atom made up of, of a nucleus um, containing um, neutrons and protons and what's important for later is that a nucleus uh, neutrons are made of, of neutrons have zero electric charge and protons have positive electric charge so the nucleus is overall positive electric charge and then the atom is generally surrounded orbited by electrons which have an, a negative electric charge so in our simple little drawing we've got here we've got a nucleus in blue there and then an electron in red so our gas looks like this hopefully that's coming through um nicely on your screens um sometimes it doesn't but this is what a gas it's looking good like. it's looking very good okay. great great um so this is our this is our gas very simply um if we keep giving energy to that gas those very strong bonds which hold the, the atom together uh so the electron to the nucleus uh start to break themselves um, and this is the, the sort of energy that you would find, say, in the centre of the sun, for example. So you give an atom enough energy and it goes for a process called ionisation, where the electron breaks away from the atom. And you're left with a nucleus with no electron. And we call this an ion. Um, and we're left with a, an electron without a nucleus or um, the technical term would be a free electron. So a gas with enough energy becomes... Uh, becomes a, a new state of matter that we refer to as plasma. So this is the fourth state of matter. Um, and what's interesting about plasma is that it's because 
we're now we've now got separate electric charges so instead of an atom that's got negative and positive charges we've got ions which are positively charged and we've got free electrons which are uh, negatively charged so we've got all sorts of different electrical charges um in all different places now uh, which is significant when you when you have plasma in space because space is full of magnetic fields generated by planets um, and stars and so on um, and this is a, a illustration of an, a magnetic field um, moving across the screen um, I'm, I'm just going to show you what it looks like to when you put a charge when you throw a charged particle across um, across a magnetic field so here's our magnetic field coming out of the screen so here's uh that's what's that that's a proton <clears throat> if you uh, so described by these uh mathematical equations up here which i'll not go into but this is describes the lorentz force which is a force that says if you move a charged particle in a magnetic field quite simply it will move in a circle it'll move around the direction of the magnetic field as you can see here it's coming out in out of the screen and the particle is going to move in a circular direction um, another important aspect of how charged particles move in magnetic fields is that that force is only acts in a, a one single direction. So the particles can move along the field, but they still move in a circular motion when, we're, when they're going across the field. So they're kind of trapped in the same place in the field, apart from they can move along the field lines. And that's really important to understand how plasmas behave in space, because if you take your plasma that we had earlier and you add a magnetic field, the particles did behave in somewhat predictable ways which we can use to understand um to understand the interactions that go on in space which i'll i'll, I'll take a dive into uh, in a little bit um and just an interesting fact 90 99% of all matter in the whole universe is plasma so despite the fact that we generally deal with solids liquids and gases um we're obviously a, a small part of the whole universe most of it is plasma um, and a question I commonly get is, what about antimatter and dark matter? And stuff? that's that's not ordinary matter. I don't know anything about that. Ordinary matter, 99% of it is plasma in the whole universe. And that 1% is your solids, liquids, gases, and other rarer forms of matter. Um, so onto the exciting stuff. So this, this is the sun. Um, that is essentially a huge ball of plasma. Um, it's held together by its... Uh, massive gravitational pull um which through nuclear process so it, it basically fuses all these ions and electrons together and, and creates a um a constant nuclear reaction so it's kind of balanced by the gravitational pull to the center and the outward force of the of the nuclear reaction that's going on um and when we look at a, a nice photo of the sun like this it's not just the big bright ball of plasma that we see in the sky there's lots of interesting features going on so you can see very clearly some bright spots or more active spots and you can see some darker or less active spots and you can also see around the edges um coming off the surface there's um plumes of of well what we what we know is plasma um and, and gas coming off the surface of the sun there so there's lots going on. Now th this is a single pic. This is a picture of the sun in a, in a particular wavelength of light, so a particular filter on the camera from this spacecraft. This taken at exactly the same time using a different filter. So the last one was I think a UV filter, UV wavelength light. This one is closer to X-ray length light. Um, at the, exactly the same time, and we can see the difference between those two photos. We can see now much better. Um, the plasma and the magnetic makeup of the sun. So we know this is plasma, and because of the this, the plasma particles, the charged particles spinning around the magnetic field, they basically stay. They move along the magnetic field, and they can't move across it. So it, we can see very clearly the sun's magnetic field because the plasma is sticking to uh, the magnetic field line, so the shape of it. So we can see magnetic activity here with these loops of plasma. Um, which create actually surprisingly detailed um, detailed visual structures. Um, and you can see very clearly that the plasma that sort of gets ejected out into, into space as well, as well as these loops of plasma which stay attached to the sun. And that's, um, I've not got much on the sun because I'm, I'm not a solar physicist, but it's um, a, a nice example of how we can 
understand more about the sun by looking, viewing it through different wavelengths of light. So um, things like magnetic magnetic activity, like we just said, but in more detail here, the, the uh, visible light spectrum, which we can see sunspots um, and so on, the atmosphere uh, for different layers of, of the sun's atmosphere and the sun's surface. Um, so one important thing about the sun for our purposes, for the space weather purposes, is the uh, fact that it changes over periods of time quite predictably. So this is an image of the sun from the 4th of June 2013, so um, about ten, well nine years ago. Um, this next one is a picture from the 1st of September 2012, uh, and you can see a clear difference between those two. In 2012 there was far more activity on the sun um, than there was in 2013. Uh, you can see lots more of these active features, lots more plumes of plasma being thrown out to the solar system. And then fast forward even more, November 2020, um, when we were all in lockdown, I think, <clears throat> the sun wasn't very active at all. So you can see one or two sort of areas of activity, but the rest of the surface is quite, uh, quite inactive. Um, and then a more recent one, so just last month, this was taken, um, the activity is starting to go up again. And th this variation in activity is a well-known phenomena known as the solar cycle. Um, <clears throat> happens every approximate, on average, every 11 years, the sun goes through a solar minimum. Um, this one particular minimum was 1996. Uh, and then the following solar maximum, 2001, back down to solar minimum in 2006. This one was 10 years long. Um, and we name our solar cycles. This one was solar cycle 23. Right now we're in solar, solar cycle 25. And that number just means the number of solar cycles since we first started measuring it. So nothing fancy. Um, and we can measure this activity uh, using sunspots because they correspond to activity, solar activity. Um, and that's what this is measuring. So the sunspot area on the sun from the 1800s here, um, all the way up to just, well, probably like 2016 or something there. Um, there's more data since then. And we can see very, very, very regularly, very, very predictably, there's a around about 11 year cycle of sunspot activity on the sun. And even more interesting, which we don't really understand a lot about, is this, there's clearly a cycle over the top of these solar cycles as well, where we get a sort of a grand maximum and, and a, as you can see, solar activity is, is sort of at a minimum of the solar solar maximum. Um, so very variable, very predictable. And I should have had this slide before, really, but this is this corresponds the sunspots in the visible light that we can see with a with a solar telescope um, correspond very nicely to the to the magnetic activity that goes on the sun's surface. It's a good indication of activity, um, and also where the sunspots are on the sun also tell us a lot about um about the solar cycle as well um so same same graph here at the top uh, on the bottom this is called a butterfly plot um no prizes for guessing why but th this is the same time period um the equator of the sun is along the middle of here and what this is telling us so oh, sorry north pole and south pole at the top and bottom what this is telling us is that at the start of a solar cycle, sunspots tend to appear closer to the north and south poles. And as we move along, they tend to appear towards the equator. And then as the new one starts towards the north and south pole again. No one really understands why. Um, it's obviously to do with the internal workings of the sun. Um, but it's just an interesting outcome of, of those dynamics. Um, so moving further out from the sun now. Um, what the sun isn't isn't just a big ball of plasma it's constantly throwing plasma um out of it so during a uh an event such as a solar eclipse like we've got here when you block out the huge amount of light that's coming from the sun it exposes the sun's atmosphere uh, sort of around the edges of the disk um and the sun's atmosphere in in solar physics they call it uh the solar corona uh, and this is what it looks like. And we can see uh, very nicely there the, the sun's magnetic field because the plasma, again, it's, it's kind of spinning around the magnetic field and it can only move along the field. 
So the plasma coming out of the sun really nicely paints uh, the magnetic field viewed from Earth, where we can see sort of some equatorial regions here, <laughs> and very, very nice and neat uh, magnetic field in, coming out of the poles there. Um, so the sun's clearly more active and it has a massive impact on the rest of the solar system. Um, one interesting thing about the solar corona is that, it, well, we don't understand why it's so hot. Um, you might have heard of the coronal heating problem. Um, what that means essentially is that the surface of the sun is about 6,000 degrees Celsius, uh, and the solar, but the solar corona can reach temperatures of up to 15 million Celsius. Um, and it's no exaggeration to say that we really don't know why that happens and why and where that energy comes from and where where that where all that heat comes from. But as the plasma gets from the surface out into the sun's atmosphere, it gets really hot and we don't know why. Um, so that's called the coronal heating problem. That's probably our field's only chance of a Nobel Prize if someone figures that one out. Um, we have we also have technology which can absorb the sun's corona. Um, this is taken from a, a ESA and NASA spacecraft called SOHO. Uh, same kind of thing. It's just put in a disk where the sun is to block out the brightness. Um, and then we can see the outflow coming from the sun's surface and the solar corona. Um, and generally, this outward flow is um, moving at around 450 kilometers per second when it's quiet. So the sort of general day to day flow. And we call this outward flow the solar wind. So it's like a, a, a solar wind that sweeps out into the solar system. Um, and every now and again, we get a burst sort of a, like that, what you just see there, a flare or a burst of, of um, plasma, uh, a solar wind. Uh, as you can see here, there's one, I'll play that again. There's one just up here, big burst there, and then a huge burst here. These events are generally referred to as solar storms, but the technical terms for them are either solar flares or a coronal mass ejection. The, this one here is a coronal mass ejection, literally means an ejection of mass from the solar corona. So it's plasma being thrown out into space at this time about um, several thousand kilometers per second um, in this case, so much faster than the sort of the normal solar wind. Um, and here's another video of the same corona mass ejection from a different spacecraft. And what's interesting about this one is that the, the corona mass ejection, or CME for short, um, passes by this spacecraft. And because it's made up of loads of charged, electrically charged particles, ions, protons, electrons, this kind of snowflakey effect, static effect that is, is created on the camera because it's, it's passing the spacecraft and it's messing with all the spacecraft electronics. So you get that effect on, on the camera as it passes by the spacecraft. Um, and then to give you kind of a, a different perspective, this is the solar system viewed from top down. So it's, this is a simulation of that same coronal mass ejection. And because the sun's rotating, you can see the solar wind kind of flows out into the solar system in a spiral shape. So you've got Mercury there, Venus, Earth, and these are the two spacecraft that we've just been looking at. Um, and you can see the big coronal mass ejection there that happened in 2012, which had it hit Earth, the consequences would have been very bad. And I'll, and I'll, um, I'll go into that a bit later. Um, this is just a nice video of a coronal mass ejection um, from the sun. Essentially looks like a huge volcanic explosion, uh, apart from the fact that the Earth is about the size of my cursor. Um, and all these millions and millions of tons of, of matter are being thrown out into space. Uh, and then, so once it's left the sun, this next video, oops, this next video is uh, another simulation of the same coronal mass ejection from 2012 of how it propagates into the solar system. So this black disk here is, uh, is the sun. These white lines are the sun's magnetic field. And as the, because the, because the plasma um, is kind of stuck to the magnetic field, as we've explained, if the plasma moves, it deforms the magnetic field. And if the magnetic field moves, it deforms the plasma. So as this CME gets propag is propagating out into the solar system, it expands and it expands with the sun's magnetic field. And after a few days, so as you can see, that's 68 hours for this one, um, it gets to about the same distance as Earth is from the sun. Um, there we go. So 
fortunately, we're not directly exposed to the to the solar wind. Um, planet a planet so Mars is ex directly exposed to the solar wind, which creates all sorts of problems. Um, but on Earth, we have a magnetic field. Uh, I'm sure you might have seen something like this: a bar magnet with a um, north pole and a south pole. It's called a dipolar magnetic field because it has two poles, and the, the field flows from north to south in the in a classic dipolar magnetic field shape. The Earth has one of these. Apart from the only difference is that Earth's magnetic field throw, flows from south to north, and that's because our magnetic field is actually upside down. So our magnetic north is in ge uh, is in geographic south, and our magnetic south is in geographic north so uh our magnetic field actually flows from geographic south to geographic north um and the reason this protects us from the solar wind somewhat is because um as i said particles plasma uh, spins around it, the, mag the magnetic field it can only move along the field never across the field so it's hard for these um energetic electrons and ions to cross over into the Earth's magnetic field. Um, so the, the result of that is um, as the solar wind passes the Earth, it gets deflected around and creates a sort of bullet-shaped cavity in space um, that we refer to as the Earth's magnetosphere. Um, there is really clear there. So this is a, a, a just a, a nice animation of the solar wind passing by, and that's kind of what is happening in space so we're creating this empty empty bullet shaped cavity um, as a result of our magnetic field and that plasma wanting to stay on the sun's magnetic field and not cross over to the earth's but this does happen every now and again because when we do get uh, a flare up of solar activity so, so say a burst of burst of solar wind like one of those coronal mass ejections or a solar flare a large amount of plasma can smash into the Earth at once, and this has the effect of actually splitting the two magnetic fields and connecting them to each other. Very complicated process called reconnection, which um, we don't really fully understand. But as far as we know, it, it connects the sun's and the Earth's magnetic field, allowing particles to flow down into the Earth's magnetic field and create danger to Earth. And when we do get one of these big disturbances, we tend to refer to it as either a geomagnetic storm or a geomagnetic substorm. And that, that it depends on how long it lasts and, and, and the overall effects. But we'll call it a geomagnetic storm <laughs> because it's um, kind of encompasses all of that. Um, and then those particles that flow down into the Earth's magnetic field can become trapped. So they don't all hit get to Earth, but they generally become trapped inside the Earth's magnetic field because I'll show this video again, the, the magnetic field tends to uh, break on the, on the day side of the Earth, so the sun's on the left, and then sort of attach itself back on the, on the night side of the, magnetic, of the magnetosphere. So this kind of stretched bit that you can see is, the, is what we call the magnetotail. Uh, and so the field constantly flows like that, and we get loads of trapped particles uh, in the Earth's magnetic field. Sorry, that was a bit all over the place, that explanation. But this is what the magnetic field tends to look like uh, with the sun on the right hand side. So you can see that it's kind of compressed on the day side where the solar wind is coming in and stretched on the night side. Uh, and these uh, lines at the top and bottom, these yellow lines, are where the Earth's magnetic field is connected to the sun's. And then where we can see these shaded regions where the Earth's magnetic field is completely enclosed. So these are where the particles are trapped um, from the sun. So uh, what we tend to get is a buildup of energetic particles and plasma in the Earth's magnetosphere. That's the moon there, just, just for reference. So the moon passes in and out of the, the magnetic field all the time. Um, and the outermost of these bubbles is the least dense because we, it's, it's kind of fresh plasma that's been... Um, that's flowed into the Earth's magnetosphere, we tend to call this the plasma sheet. Um, and as more and more particles become injected into the Earth's magnetosphere and, and build up and build up and get, get forced closer to Earth, they heat up, they become more dense, and we get a higher energy um, population called the ring current. Um, and then we get 
even hotter than that, heat um, particles heat up and heat up and heat up, and we get a sort of donut shaped pair of bands around the Earth that we call the Van Allen uh, radiation belts, which is the thing that people tend to hear of, hear of the most, in my experience, um, which is an inner belt uh, of protons and an outer belt of electrons. And these are one of the biggest problems for our technological infrastructure on Earth. So these extremely energetic, very variable um, bands of electrons and protons uh, moving around the Earth all the time and constantly being fed by uh, new particles coming in from the solar wind. Uh, and we can see this as an animation over a few days that the radiation belts aren't just um, variable in their sort of intensity. So the hotter colours, the reds and the yellows here show the, the hotter, more energetic electrons and, and the cooler colours show the, show the cooler, less energetic ones. They don't just vary in intensity, they vary in size and the shape as well. So, so they're really hard to predict. Um, and we'll go, I'll go into why in a little bit. But following the, our, the journey of our plasma from the sun, some of that, when it gets injected into the Earth's magnetosphere, flows down to Earth and hits the atmosphere. Um, and the atmosphere reacts a little bit like a neon, neon light. You give, it, you give it energetic particles uh, and the gas uh, emits light. And that's what happens in our atmosphere when we see the, um, the northern lights, or also known as the aurora borealis, or the southern lights, also known as the aurora australis. Um, and they manifest as an oval shape centered on the Earth's magnetic north and south poles. An oval shape mainly because that is essentially the footprint of the Earth's magnetic field on the Earth. It's where the particles are, are flowing down and hitting the atmosphere. Um, and the aurora is also highly variable, as is the particles coming down. So uh, during a geomagnetic storm, for example, when we get a big disturbance, the aurora can go from quite faint and quite a small oval to a quite a bright and quite a wide, wide oval. And that's where, um, for example, here, as, as a storm goes on, we can see the oval there gets bright and then it widens and widens and widens as, as the geomagnetic storm goes on. And that's why sometimes you might hear <laughs> see the northern lights in Scotland or even northern England sometimes, but generally, the best place is sort of Canada, the Scandinavia, anywhere in the Arctic Circle is the best place to see um, to see the Northern Lights. Um, and here's just a few nice images. So this is from the space station. Um, this probably isn't an exposure shot because it's on a it's on the space station, which is moving. Um, and it's, this is what it looks like from Earth. You can from the space station, you can almost see the kind of the Earth's magnetic field there. Um, through the streaks of, of aurora that you can see from above. And from the ground, of course, some of you may have seen this yourself. Um, uh, you can see the aurora pretty clearly from the ground on a, on a dark night and when there's a lot of solar activity a few days before. Um, and they generally, the aurora is associated with green colours, but you can get red aurora, you can get blue aurora um, as well. And that's determined basically by, by the particles in the, in the atmosphere. So the electrons, protons, whatever, come down and hit the atmosphere. Oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, the carbon dioxide, and so on, they all react in slightly different ways and it produces different coloured light um, in the aurora. So that's the physics side of it, um, the space weather um, kind of causes. I'm going to move on now to how that affects us and how that, um, how um our technology is affected and how we're dealing with it um which is kind of the other half of the space weather puzzle uh, and these effects that i'm going to talk about aren't effects that are theoretical or might happen or are a low risk of happening uh, these effects do happen and we have to deal with them on a regular basis so one of the most significant of those effects are something called ionospheric currents so if anyone's got either an electric toothbrush or a um, wireless phone charger, it's kind of the same thing. So the, 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 an electric toothbrush you put on a little base and you don't actually have to plug it into the toothbrush. And that's because the, the charger, the wireless phone charger or the, or the toothbrush charger generates a magnetic field. And magnetic fields, because 
the theory of electromagnetism tells us that um, a magnetic field also generates an electric current and it's that electric current which transfers energy um, into your phone or into um, into your electric toothbrush and that happens in the atmosphere as well so we have uh, a geomagnetic storm causing a big disturbance and moving the magnetic field of the earth all over the place and that drives electric currents through our atmosphere and those currents are low enough so that they can actually overload power lines and every now and again they get so strong that that causes huge problems so uh, a notable event was in march 1989 in um there was a, a big corona mass ejection from the sun a few days later it smashed into the earth um into the earth's magnetic field created these huge currents uh, in the atmosphere these electrical currents and in uh quebec in canada um their power grid was overloaded and it tripped the circuit breakers and it, it basically fried their one of the transformers um and they were left without power for about nine hours uh on a march evening in canada which is not only inconvenient it's probably also really cold um so that's one of the big major effects of of these these atmospheric electric currents um and this we're all we're at risk of this uh as i speak right now so a, a big solar storm could cause power outages and, and so on all over the world uh so another thing is that these these electric currents can disrupt things like gps signal they can disrupt um communication in aviation military um and so on one one big thing gps is very significant because we're becoming increasingly reliant on it so um, we've always used the satellite navigation at some point, presumably. Um, things like wireless trains um, are, are becoming more common. Wireless farm vehicles are becoming more, sorry, not wireless, driverless. So they use GPS to, na to navigate themselves. Um, and of course, we aviation, um, we use GPS. Uh, it doesn't just disrupt their communications, it disrupts their GPS. And so they're kind of a handful of the Earth-based problems that we have to deal with. But another very significant thing is up in space. So we have thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of man-made satellites orbiting the Earth um, that we use for day-to-day for -day things. So telephone signal, uh, internet, GPS, and so on. And this is kind of an illustration here. As you would expect, there's, there's lots of satellites close to the Earth but you can see obvious rings of satellites kind of further out which perform important tasks and these are the ones most at danger because um sorry go back one this big ring here is um a very busy part of earth orbit called geostationary orbit or geosynchronous orbit which essentially is is the part is, is the the area of orbit which in which a satellite will orbit the earth at the same rate that earth spins so it's looking at the same point on the surface the whole time and that's a valuable um that's a valuable thing so uh the the important thing about geostationary orbit is that um it's inside the radiation belts um and that, so sorry i've got disrupted because my dad brought me a beer um <laughs> the uh Geostationary orbit is inside the radiation belts, so which is one of the most un unpredictable parts of space weather. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to go back a little bit because I got I got flustered. Then, <laughs> um, geostationary orbit is very populated with satellites. It sits right inside the Van Allen radiation belts, which we've talked about it earlier about being very unpredictable, varying in intensity, varying in size. Um, and the highly energetic particles um, in the radiation belts uh, can damage the satellites in many ways. So the importance of those satellites, we've got, as I've said, military um, communications, sort of telephone signal, GPS, uh, that all operate either consistently within the radiation belts um, or at least pass through the radiation belts. And the kind of damage that can be done so significantly is the um, physical damage here. So this is um, tested in a laboratory, but some some particles um, fired at a solar some solar arrays, and they can they can literally 
nail parts of the solar array. array. Uh, but the more sort of significant, more um, regular problem is the um, the electrical interference that those particles can can do. Um, so they can cause the part the satellites to uh, shut down completely. They can disrupt the the communications. They can they can mess with all the operations. So uh, moving on to the sort of research we do, uh, how are we going about trying to solve this problem? Because the idea is we want to understand the, the all these uh, space weather um, phenomena to the point of predictability. So. Um, what we've got here is a, is a plot that I made quite a few, a couple of years ago, um, which illustrates our, our, our problems quite nicely. So we, what we've got is the intensity of electrons in, the, in one of the radiation belts um, versus time. So across the year of uh, 1998 uh, and three different locations within the radiation belts. So the blue line is at one location, the, or the blue solid line, the dotted line is at another location, the, the dashed line is at another. And what we can see here is that generally all three of these locations, the intensity of electrons follows the same um, pattern, sort of does the same thing kind of. So when we get a spike in these intensities, all three of these spike. When we get a gradual slope, um, all three of them do the same thing. Um, but then occasionally that doesn't happen. So uh, in the, in this solid location, the blue line location here, um, about 50 days into 1998, we get a drop in intensity in the blue location, and the other two we get a spike. Same here, a drop uh, drop in the intensity. Um, here they're kind of doing different things, and then here we've got a kind of gradual slope, a decrease in intensities, but the green line is 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 doing something slightly different. Uh, so. What, oops, what I'm trying to illustrate from all this is that it's not just a sort of global process. There's lots of different detailed things going on inside there, and it makes it really difficult to understand. So there's lots of things going on all at once, which we have to try and understand. Uh, and so zooming out then back out of the research. So uh, what kind of spacecraft can we use? So we, we obviously need to go up into space uh, and observe it. Um, ultimately, what happens at Earth isn't determined by what happens at the sun, but is influenced by what happens at the sun. Um, and so understanding those processes right back at the sun helps us able, be able to predict this activity. So this is an illustration of a recently launched spacecraft called Solar Orbiter, which you may have heard of. There's also a similar one called Parker Solar Probe, uh, which, which some people have heard of that as well, um, which and Solar Orbiter in particular here is aiming to go closer to the sun than any spacecraft has ever gone before. It's going to go inside the orbit of Mercury, about 40 million kilometers from the surface. Uh, that's five times um, closer than Earth. So, and then it can, what, how that's going to be useful is because it can measure things like the intensity, the, the speed, the, um, the temperature, and, and all sorts of different characteristics of the plasma that's flowing outwards um from the sun uh and it could help us go some way towards understanding the coronal heating problem so why the solar corona is is um so hot while the surface is comparatively so cold although six thousand degrees i wouldn't consider cold um and this is i was meant to take this out but i'll go through it anyway so the this is part of the the solar orbiter's journey to the sun so it launches earth here and Essentially, because Earth is moving around the sun at about 60, 70,000 miles per hour, the solar orbiter spacecraft has to basically slow down really, really significantly and then fall into the sun. And you can see that trajectory here. So it kind of it uses the gravity of, of Earth um, a few times and Venus as it passes by to kind of slingshot it into the sun and get really, really close to the surface. Um, and this is a really nice picture from, from Solar Orbiter that was taken I think earlier this year of a coronal mass ejection. It's it's one of the probably the most incredible photos of of solar activity that we've ever taken. Uh, we can see an entire coronal mass ejection. That's you're talking several millions of miles um, long in length there, um, coming from the sun, taken taken by solar orbiter. Um, and I always like to emphasise 
what out what the UK what part the UK has played in in these kind of missions uh, and particularly uh, MSSL UCL where I used to work. Um, so this instrument here is the electron analyzer. So that the instrument that measures the electrons and tells us about the electrons flowing in the solar wind um, was built in the UK MSSL um, UCL. Um, on the spacecraft, there's also a heavy ion sensor to, to, to measure um, to measure heavy ions, and then a proton sensor as well, as well as a data processing unit to send and that sends that data back to Earth. Um, but this instrument was built at UCL. Um, here it is here. Th these two cylinders on the end they get hold, held out on a big boom um, from the spacecraft into the solar wind. Electrons flow into these little gaps here, and then some very complicated electronics tell us about the properties of those electrons and as i've mentioned um and it things like energy temperature the speed of them um and all sorts of properties about them which help us understand the processes in the solar wind these two people are the two the two pis the two leaders of this instrument uh, who are both at mssl C professor chris owen professor louise hara uh, some people know who they are some people don't but um they two two significant people in this mission who who i've worked with myself um, and then here's the spacecraft um, sort of all folded up, ready to be placed onto a rocket. So it's about the size of a small car. Um, and you can see all, yeah, all the instruments are folded away, ready to, ready to go. And this, this here on the front is, um, is the shield which protects the internals from the, from the solar wind to stop them from interfering with the electronics of the spacecraft. And believe it or not, this shield is made up from ground up cow bones. Um, so for those that care, this is not a vegan spacecraft, unfortunately, but um, who would have thought? Not Definitely not me. Apparently that is a cost effective and, and lightweight way of protecting a spacecraft from the solar wind. Um, and here's the launch of Solar Orbiter back in February 2020, where um, unfortunately I wasn't one of them, but half of our lab got to go out to Florida to watch the launch. Um, and here is a, a nice exposure shot of the uh, spacecraft on its way to the sun, um, supposedly there. Um, and Solar Orbiter right now, it's, it's uh, already been closer to the sun than we've ever been before, but it's due to get closer. It's done a few pass-bys of Earth um, on its way there. Uh, and yeah, so just since I used to work there, I'll change this once I'm officially at University of California, but I'm just going to promote the Mullard Space Science Laboratory a little bit. Um, it's in the middle of the Surrey Hills, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it's a really nice location, um, really nice place to work. Uh, you get sweeping views of the Surrey Hills from, from uh, well, from this bit here at the front. Um, and what's unique about the Mullard Space Science Laboratory is that we kind of are involved in every step of of science so in this big new building here uh, we build spacecraft and we clean spacecraft and assemble them we send them off to ESA or NASA to get to launch and then we also have officers that collect the data coming down from the spacecraft our operations teams and calibrate it who then give that data to researchers like myself who use it to understand the science and what's going on uh, in space so we're, we're pretty unique in that regard uh, i would encourage you to e email the outreach and get on their waiting list if you're interested in visiting because they do they're now actually pretty pretty regularly doing open days uh, or open evenings where you can go and visit and go and uh, have a tour of the place have some talks from some people who work there um so uh, that's nothing to do with me because i'm not there anymore but yeah i would encourage you if you want to visit to to go on their website and, and send them an email um, and this is an example of all the missions that that MSL have been involved in um, over the years so every one of these rocket launches has got a instrument on it built uh, at the Mullard Space Science Laboratory in Surrey and of course that in the UK as well so you, the UK is contributing to lots and lots of these missions even if it's NASA which is American um, People contribute from all over the world, and the UK is a regular contributor in all those space missions as well. Um, so, final final couple of slides. Um, this is uh, a desk in the Met Office in Exeter, 
This single desk is called the uh, MOSWOC, which stands for the Met Office Space Weather Operations Center. Um, and what this, this guy sat at the desk is doing is essentially looking at all the things we've looked at um, during this talk. So the activity on the surface of the sun, um, the flow of the solar wind out of the solar corona um, and how it propagates out into the solar system. Um, and essentially what, what whoever's sitting at that desk, what their job is, is to identify when there's a threat to satellites, to infrastructure and to send an alert out when necessary. Um, of So they might say there is X percent chance of um, X amount of risk uh, over the next few days. And then the companies who, own, who operate the satellites can take that sort of risk risk reward um, decision as to whether to stay switched on and not lose any business or any operations or switch off and not risk their satellite being uh, completely ruined by by the the energetic charge particles in the solar wind um so we can make predictions sort of a few days in advance at the minute but there's a wildly varying levels of accuracy and there's a lot of research going in to uh, improve those those uh, predictions um, but you can go and actually look at these predictions yourself. Uh, if you just Google Met, Met Office space weather, it'll take you to a page that gives you all of this information about the recent solar imagery, imagery uh, auroral forecasts. If you go into anywhere to see the aurora, you can get a, um, a few days in advance what they think the aurora is going to look like and where. Um, and uh, you can get like a nice little summary. So this is from this is from 21st of October this year. A four day four day space weather where well, you can get a 24 hour sort of review of space weather and then here you can get a four day space weather summary uh, sorry forecast summary so this one in particular not very interesting it says solar activity likely to be low or very low for the next four days geomagnetic activity no no cmes um likely to remain quiet so there would obviously be no alert going out to satellite operators in that case um, so yeah, interesting, um, interesting thing to go and sort of look at and play around with. And all my images of the sun that I got were from a website called Helio Viewer, which, which you can also uh, go to yourself. Just Google Helio Viewer, and you can sort of look at the sun. It's you can get a lot, essentially a live, live <coughs> second to second shot of the sun um, by going on Helio Viewer. It's really interesting to look uh, the sun in the different wavelengths as well. Uh, so that's the end of my talk. Uh, hopefully you learnt something um, and yeah, ha very happy to take any questions now.